All right, good morning, everyone. We are going to get started on our year-end closing webinar. Hopefully today we will help you um, figure out how to make your year-end closing in Microsoft Dynamics GP simple and painless. Um, we do do this presentation every year. Um, we'll put it up on our YouTube channel so that you can watch it. There aren't any fundamental changes this year. There are a couple little tweaks, um, but we'll get into those as we go through. Getting to this video, but it sounds like everybody else. All right, so let's get started. Um, my name is Devin Southall. I have been um, an implementation consultant for GP at SSG for over 13 years. I've got a background in accounting and small business. Um, so we've done this a lot. I'm sort of the problem fixer. If you have a problem with your end clothes, I'm the one that gets called in. Um, so I'm going to try to warn you of all the pitfalls so that hopefully you don't have to talk to me this year. Um, here's our agenda. We're going to talk about creating a new fiscal year. If you've never done it before, it is not intuitive. Um, but once you do it, it makes sense. We're going to talk about the module year-end closes. So there are year-end closes for the various modules, accounts receivable, accounts payable, tax, inventory, payroll, and fixed assets. You will notice there are different sizes on here that goes to their relative importance. We're going to talk about your financial year-end close, the biggie, the one that really matters. And we're going to talk a little bit briefly on Payables 1099 printing. Just go through that process again. It's always good to have a refresher and a reminder. All right. If your fiscal year is not calendar, there are some subtle differences to this process. Um, if your fiscal year is not calendar, you're going to need to do two closed processes. For your calendar year, so coming up now in, in December, January, you're going to want to do sales. You're going to want to do purchasing, and you're going to want to do payroll. For your fiscal year, so whenever your fiscal year ends, you're going to want to do sales and purchasing also, fixed assets, and financial. And you need to decide how you want to run your tax and inventory numbers. For the rest of today's call, I'm going to assume that your fiscal year is calendar, but feel free to uh, wave your hand, put a chat, or ask a question um, if you are not calendar and you have specific questions. All righty. So everyone's good with that. We're going to move on. First off, we're going to do a demo on how to create a new fiscal year. Um, steps are in here. Um, so let me actually do this for you. I am in Microsoft Dynamics GP 2016. Um, it looks fundamentally the same as 2018 or 2018 R2. Um, you're going to either want to start here in administration or up here in Microsoft Dynamics GP. So Microsoft Dynamics GP, tools, setup, company, and fiscal periods. You will notice in my company, I have through 2019 set up. So the next year I can set up is 2020. And here's the non-intuitive part. You type in this dropdown, 2020. You press tab. At this point, it should come up with the correct first day. If it does not come up with the correct first day, you're going to want to go back and check what you're doing. And the bottom should be blank. So you might want to tweak your end day if something's different. Your number of periods are going to be 12 and press calculate. I had a client report to me that their calculate button was taking a lot longer in the newer versions. Um, it, if you have really giant budgets, it may take a lag when you press calculate. Pause, hold on, it, it's going to come up. But apparently, if your budgets are quite large, that can be something to um, be uh, aware of. Any questions? So right now I am done. There's no save. I have created the 2020 year. All I need to do is press OK, which will close me out of the screen. And if I come back, it's going to be there for me. Um, do remember to close all these boxes so people don't post into that year um, inadvertently. If you're just trying to create it, you don't want people um, posting into it. Any questions on creating a new year? Or is everyone good with that one? All right, no one's raising their hand. So we are going to keep going. All right, 
So can you do transactions in 2019 before you have closed your year? Yes. Little exception, payroll and fixed assets. Payroll and fixed assets are a little different, but as long as you're not using the payroll module and the fixed assets module, you can definitely do transactions in 2019 before you've closed your year. So feel free to make those journal entries out ahead. Or, um, so when you do any of your closes, will history be deleted? This is always a concern. Um, the answer to that is no, as long as your maintain history checkboxes are selected. It is always a good process to double check that they are. Um, these are located for general ledger, bank reconciliation, payroll. They're on the module setup screens, and they look something like this. Um, for vendors, customers, items, and tax details, they're on every single item card. They look like that. I actually just had a customer where we discovered that a couple dozen items weren't set to maintain history and it was causing all sorts of reconciliation issues. So definitely something to check. Um, you can run yourself a smart list to check these. They're available on, say, the item smart list or the vendor smart list. And if you've got um, a large problem to fix, uh, feel free to contact us and we can fix them in the back end and make sure everything's set to maintain history. Um, housekeeping. Before doing any sort of year-end close or routine, best practices is get all users out of GP in any related programs. So any programs that are nested in the GP database like SalesPad or Vicinity or any of those other third-party products like MR. Back up all your databases. And if you're going to archive them, which is a generally a recommendation, you'll want IT to back up what's called your Dynamics Database 2. That's sort of the anything under system that's set system-wide is in Dynamics. Um, run your closing routine and only let users back in if the process is successful. Um, and we'll talk about this in specific, but I always want to stress these archives. You never know when you're going to need an archive backup. We had a customer just a couple weeks ago. Um, something happened, and a user inadvertently months ago deleted some vendor history. And we were able to find an older archive to at least restore some of that. And so that's why we talk about uh, the archives are for the disaster recovery. Um, and it's always good to have at least one a year, if not more often. Any questions on this sort of housekeeping things to pay attention to? All right, if not, we'll move on. All right, so during the close process, it's a great time to do some certain GP routines that move your transactions to history. Remember, in receivables, things are not moved to history automatically, like in payables. There is a routine called paid transaction removal, which uh, is badly named. I hate the fact that it says removal in the name, but as long as back on that other screen, your history checkbox is created, um, you, this actually just moves it to history. And the same with remove complete purchase orders also does not remove them. It just moves them to the history tables. Um, we do not recommend a routine called period consolidation. Um, that actually takes your details of your journal entries and pushes them together. Um, the problem we run into with the period consolidation is it makes unbalanced journal entries. And so if you end up with a truly unbalanced journal entry, it's really hard to figure out which is the one that had been peer, period consolidated and which is the one that really has a problem. And so we definitely discourage that. Um, but one of the notes before doing any of these removals is to um, if feel free to call us ahead of time and run some data, data checks. That way um, we can make sure there's not going to be any issues with them. Or get everyone out, make a backup, and then if you have an issue, you can always restore to that backup and um, resolve that problem. Most of the time, knock on wood, there isn't a problem, but again, remember, I'm the exception department, we see the problems. So we just want you to be aware that there is a possibility. All right. Um, should you run GP utilities for check links or reconciles? Uh, 15 years ago, Microsoft said, yes, run them, run them all the time, run them this way. They've sort of backed off from that recommendation. But really, now we recommend running check links and reconciles 
only have if you have a very specific data issue and only run the runs related to your issue and probably try it in a test company first. From an accounting perspective, it can change financial data. Um, check links and reconciles try to make sure that the data in the various tables are the same. And if it finds a data anomaly, it's going to try to fill in that missing data. And sometimes it's what you want, and sometimes it's it can change things like inventory evaluation. And so it's always good to be um, cautious and careful with those. Only run them when you really need to. Okay. Any questions on um, any of the housekeeping issues? All right. Fabulous. I'm going to move on. So let's talk about the module closes. We're talking about accounts receivable, accounts payable, and there is a module close for tax also. So if you're using tax, this moves it to history. What do these module closes do? It's relatively straightforward. For the module closes, it updates various year-to-date fields to zero and moves the current year-to-date numbers in the prior year fields. Okay, where do we see these fields? Those fields are seen on your smart lists, on your customer or vendor inquiry screens, and on a handful of summary reports. I've gone on customers who have never run these closes and they just don't have prior year to date numbers and they have really large year to date numbers. It's not the end of the world. It's just sort of annoying if you go pull one of the smart lists and try to find, you know, year to date sales and go, that number doesn't look right. That's why. All right. So because it's somewhat simplistic on how it works, it's hard to find a perfect time to run these, particularly for payables. Payables, one of the beauties of payables in GP is you can be in multiple periods. I can start January when you haven't finished December yet. It's great from an accounting perspective. It works fabulous from an accounting perspective, but it runs into a little glitch with these module closes and these summary numbers. So our solution is one of two things. Either one, close it at the most logical period. So receivables, I would close it as soon as you have done that final posting from December. And yeah, you might not have a cash receipt or two, but it's going to be close enough. Payables, you're just going to sort of have to guess when you want to do it, depending on what makes the best sense. If you are using these year-to-date numbers places and you want them to be 100% accurate, we have SQL scripts that can be run after the fact and sort of true and fix those numbers. And it'll calculate it from the transaction history and make them perfect. So again, it's up to you on um, what makes the best sense and whether you're going to use these year-to-date numbers. So let me pop out of my projection for a second and just show you these real quick. Come on, I'm hitting escape. There we go. So here in GP, and I'm going to look at payables. So if I come here to purchasing, and I go to my payable summary inquiry here and put in a particular vendor. Actually, this isn't even the one I want to go to. See, I always go to the... Actually, let me go to receivables, sorry. Um, it, they're easier to get to. So if I go to my receivables here and pull up a customer, I'm talking about these numbers here. So these numbers are really based on um, that last thing that you run. And for payables, it would be, say, your smart list here. So if I go to my vendor's smart list and I look at some of my year-to-date numbers, these, these life year-to-date, these are all those summary numbers that I'm talking about. And any of those numbers are the ones you would be concerned about. Okay. Any questions on those before I move on? I have a question. Sure. Our our fiscal year end is June 30th. Yep. So if we go resetting these a year, say on January 1st. Yep. 
it's going to put into our previous year to date, but it's really not our previous year to date. It's still our year to date. That's why you have to decide when you want to run those numbers. Okay. And so um, you need to decide. I thought you said we have. Yep, you say we have to close twice. Yep. That even if we have a fiscal year that crosses, we still have to close at the end of December. So if on January 1st we ran that, and it would put it into the previous year to date. So this is where I'm understanding fiscal, it incorrectly. Fiscal and calendar comes into place. Okay. So there is a fiscal close and a calendar close. Now, do you want those summary numbers to be your calendar summary numbers? or your fiscal summary numbers? Well, we always run fiscal. So okay. if we had said at the end of January, um, you know, if we start in July, that's our year, or that's our month one, our period one. Mm -hmm. And if we go clearing things out on January 1st, if I'm understanding this correct correctly, it's going to say at the end of January, your year to date is your January numbers, not July through January. Right. And so most people run, and I'll double check that for you, Mary, and get back to you. I am pretty sure that these numbers system-wise are cleared out when you run the calendar close. And I will double check that for you because if you see, I've popped up the close screen. Oops, let me get out of that so you can see it. And it has a fiscal option and a calendar option. Um, and so... We can double check that for you to make sure that okay. we're having. That I don't want to lose that data. Exactly the way you want them to be. Yep. No. Nope. Good question. Okay. 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 Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? All right. Beautiful. All right. So moving on. What about your 1099s? You'll find this kind of confusing because if you read, and I'll have links at the very end of the presentation, the actual Microsoft instructions say before you run the payables close, print your 1099s. I'm not entirely sure why they say that because you don't need to print them before you do the payables close. It is a completely independent process. Your 1099 balances are kept by period, by year, and has absolutely no effect on doing your close. So. Um, my advice is you do your clothes when you want to. Your 1099s are going to be completely unaffected. And we'll talk about how to run those in a little bit. All right. So let's talk about the inventory clothes. I want to talk about the inventory clothes separately just because there's a couple things to be aware of. Same thing with your year-to-date fields. It does the exact same functionality as the other ones we talked about. And it's the same places you're going to see those on smart lists. You're going to see those on a couple inquiry windows. If it's a year to date, if it has year to date, prior year and life, those are the summary numbers we're talking about. Um, the important thing on your year end close is these remove buttons here really, truly delete data. So you want to be super careful that you really think through, do you want to re permanently remove data from your database? Um, on those check boxes. You know, back in the olden days when data was really expensive, um, we wanted to uh, sometimes purge extraneous data. But nowadays, data is cheap. It is better off to keep it so you can have questions. So do be careful about those checks. And if you're using lot attributes for some tracing, you never want to remove those. So important things. Any questions on that? All right, moving on. Payroll year in closing. Um, I know Ken's a payroll customer, and they've been through this a million times. I don't know if anyone else is, but I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Um, anyone who does payroll probably done it a million times. Your payroll year in closing is pretty specific. Um, your year in closing actually creates your year in file, which you make for your W-2s. You always want to make a backup before running it. There is a very specific knowledge base article. But really, the tricky part is your tax tables. When you're doing the year-end close, you want to have a tax table for 2018. If you're processing payroll for 2019, you want to have a 2019 tax table in place. 
There are our tax rate changes for this year, so you're going to want to pay attention to that. And our payroll customers should be already in the process of getting the year-end update for the 2018 because there are code changes because that's payroll. Um, the flow chart is one of two things. It depends on whether you can get your numbers all done before you do your 2019 payroll. So your last payroll in 2008, do your year-end closing, print your W-2s, put your new tax table in, and then run 2019 payroll. If you're not going to be 100% done, you do this little loop flow, which is do your payroll in 2018, install your tax tables, pay some people in 2019, then before you do your year-end closing, put back your 2018 tax tables, and so on. You just got to have the right tax tables in at the right times. Any questions on that before we moved on to fixed assets? Beautiful. All right, fixed assets. Fixed assets is a fun module. The year end close is run for one or more books. It is a hard close, meaning that you can only be in one year at a time. You have to completely finish 2018, including all of your retirements and whatever else. Close it before you can move on and do anything in 2019, including depreciation. So you have to finish all transactions, additions, retirements, and depreciation before you close. Um, although it's closed per book, you can't move on to 2019 until you have closed all your books. And so you can start it, but you can't move on. And so really, you close each of the books for 2018, then you can start 2019. And there is also a Microsoft Dynamics GP knowledge base article we strongly recommend you get for this module. There are quite a few reports that cannot be reprinted after year end, almost all of them. There is one or two that they have added special in the last couple of years to allow you to reprint historically. Um, so that's one that definitely uh, get the link, get this PowerPoint, and make sure you follow that meticulously and reprint all the reports you need. Yes, Amy, we can get you a copy of the PowerPoint. Amy's always, our Amy, who sent you the newsletter and the link can get you that. Um, I'll give her the PowerPoint and she can get it. And we will also be posting this video up on YouTube and you can watch that if you'd like. No problem. All right. Moving on to the big one that everyone came for. Our financial or our GL close. What does it do? It creates your beginning balances for your balance sheet accounts and your retained earnings. It also, unless you change the default checkboxes, will delete unused inactive accounts, even if they're on budgets. It will do a hard close on the prior year. So if we're closing 2018, you are fully locked down and cannot touch 2017. Keep in mind that if you're on a more recent supported version, there is an undo. So I guess if you really wanted to make those 2017 entries, we could get everyone out of all your companies, roll your back up, roll you back, and then um, allow you to do those 2017 entries. Can you still make entries to the year after close? Yes, even in your subledgers if you needed to. So if I have closed 2018 and the auditors come by in March or so and say, no, 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 you need to do this journal entry and you need to get this sucker off payables or whatever you need to do, you can do that. Um, in your general ledger setup, there is this checkbox here, posting to history, that needs to be checked. In addition, your fiscal periods have to be open to allow posting to those. Now, um, what I always like to warn people is that the journal entries when you're posting those, those posting journals look funky. It kind of looks like it's doubling itself. And this is not, this is easier to see if you're not posting to the last day of the month. So if you're posting to say October 1st, you'll see one journal entry dated October 1st, and then you'll see a second journal entry dated December 31st. And it kind of, you can say, oh, right, right, that's my balance brought forward entry. If your entry is dated December 31st, they're both dated December 31st, and that's confusing. 
but really what it's doing is it's actually making an entry to your balance brought forward um, for that beginning of the year so that the instant you post that entry, it is um, your beginning balance is correct. All right. Any questions on that? Because it's an important distinction that people understand. Fabulous. All right. So when do you want to do your financial year in closing? Anytime is possible. The best time is after your subledgers are complete for you the year. So after you have finished receivables, you've finished payroll, oh, sorry, you've finished payables, you have run your inventory reports, you have done your fixed assets, you have finished your bank racks. After the bulk of your year-end entries are made, it's just easier to have one big balance brought forward entry and not a whole bunch of little ones. Um, and you need to do it before running financial statements for the new year because you cannot run financial statements in MR for the new year unless you jump through hoops to get your beginning balances on them or you've run your fiscal year end. Because if you go look at an inquiry window in GP, there is no beginning balances on all your balance sheet accounts. So the balance on the screen looks wrong because it doesn't have that balance brought forward yet. Um, most people close in about mid-February. You can do it sooner, you can do it later. It's kind of up to you guys. Um, questions on that, because it is important to remember your how the system looks when you're in the next year and you haven't closed yet. So for example, I'm going to pull up my financial, and this is my test company. All right, hold on, I've got myself jammed. Oh yeah, there it is. Come on, close. There we go. So if I go here to financial, hold on everybody, cancel, there we go. Now I can drive. All right, if I go to my summary inquiry here and I pull my cash operating account, you can see how 2017 has an ending balance. But if I look at 2018, that balance is not brought over yet because I have not closed 2017 yet. And so that's what happens on your accounts is there should be a beginning balance on 18, but 18, 17 isn't closed yet. So if I go to like an inquiry window or a trial balance, it looks a little funky. All right. Any questions on that? All right. So let's talk about your important closed steps. Most important, can't stress it enough. Check your account posting types, which I'm going to cycle and show you in just a second when we get through this list, a quickie smart list that you can run. So check your account posting types. Post all the transactions. It's really best not to have transactions floating in unposted state if you can avoid it. Um, so go ahead and post that. You must get everyone out of GP. Please do not close while people are in the system. Um, you also have to have IT or someone else verify that there is sufficient free hard space, hard drive space on the server. This is the number one reason we have for failed closes. That database has to triple in size. So IT can peek and say, oh, you have a one gig database. You need to have at least three gigs of spare space to have that sucker work. Okay. So um, we want to make backups and archive them. Again, make backups of your company, your Dynamics database, your MR reports. If you use Smart Connect, you can back up the Smart Connect database. This is your chance once a year to archive these, tuck them aside in case something happens. And unfortunately, it's the something happens and no one noticed it right away that we're saving this for. Um, a couple times a year, we have to ask customers, so did you archive a backup? Because we're going to need it based on some crazy situation that happens. Okay. 
Do not end task on your close, even if it says not responding. It might say not responding. Um, that's just that your local GP is waiting for an answer from the server. And this takes a bit of time on the server, depending on the size of your company. If you have added modules this year, particularly multi-currency or analytical accounting, your close is going to take significantly longer than it did in the past. Okay, those, those particular modules make the close take significantly longer. And the first year, you, you're going to be surprised. Um, if you're not using analytical accounting or multi-currency and you don't have, um, you know, a million transactions, it's pretty fast. Um, but it, you're better off letting it run and then calling for help if it's still stuck rather than ending your close. If you end your close, you're definitely going to have to roll back to a backup. Check the close before letting people back into GP to do work. Microsoft also recommends taking another backup and archiving this. Um, that's up to you. I, I haven't really seen any issues between the first backup and the second backup that I found a need to have two. Uh, how, how safe do you want to be? Um, if there are issues, restore your backup and try again, and maybe in a test company. You cannot use the reverse historical year for fixing a failed clause, you're just going to have more troubles, okay? So you want to go back to the backup if, if it has a problem. Any questions on that? I'm going to move the next piece is um, to talk about your posting types. All right, be beautiful. So uh, the back to the prior slide in that the most important thing is to make sure your posting types are correct. Your posting types are what control whether a beginning balance is going to be brought forward or not. And if new accounts are added during the year, it's kind of easy to get these set up incorrectly. So what you're going to want to do is go to a smart list. So Microsoft Dynamics GP smart list. And the smart list you're going to want to go to is your financial and your accounts. Now you can see by default accounts and posting type is on here. So if I, I can just run my whole list of accounts and sort by posting type and make sure they look right. I also could put in a search criteria. So I can say where my, most people have a column that's called main account, a main segment. So your main account segment should be that natural segment. And generally, there's a dividing line somewhere around 3,000, 2,000. So I'm going to say that my main account segment is less than 3,000. And my posting type is equal to profit and loss. So it shouldn't be less than 3,000 and a profit and loss. Hey, look, I don't have any. And if I flip that to greater than and equal to balance sheet, I again shouldn't have accounts. And I have a couple special accounts. Um, if your account categories are zero, You'll want to look at those. Those are probably unit accounts or fixed or variable allocation accounts. You can double check that. So that's why having the account category on here is helpful. Um, but these are accounts that have been set up incorrectly. This is set up as a balance sheet account, and that is wrong. And so if I close right now and this account had a balance in December, it's going to get a good beginning balance, and my retained earnings is going to be incorrect. So that's why it's critical to do this routine. Um, the advice from Microsoft now is to undo your close and then redo it. Um, that involves getting everyone out of all of your companies. It's um, a lot of fun. Questions on checking your account types? Beautiful. All right, let's talk about the year and close screen. Uh, so that's financial, routines, year and closing. Again, yours might be moved around. You can move these tiles around. 
So depending on what version you are, the screen has looked at this since um, mid-GP 2013, I think it was 2013 R2, that they added this progress bar on here, and they added the reverse close your button. Your retained earnings account should be set up. If it's not set up, you can fill it in. If you have your retained earnings set to um, spread to segments, it will make sure that all the segments are set up as one of your first steps, but it's always good to check that. Most people don't change your starting journal entry, but if for some reason you wanted to, you could change that. Um, if you wanted to remove unused segment numbers, you can, but notice this is not checked. So by default, it's going to delete any inactive accounts, even if they're on a budget. Um, if you want to keep your accounts and not have any changes, you're going to want to check this box and change the radio buttons to all inactive accounts. And that will leave your chart of accounts untouched during the process. Julie, yeah, send uh, Amy Coddington an email and we'll, uh, she'll get you the PowerPoint. Okay. Um, so at this point, you just hit close year. Notice I haven't closed 2014 and see how fast it is. It says, all right, I've got a single used journal entry batch. This is why it's always good. But if for some reason you didn't want to post that, you can continue and it will continue. And it's also warning me I have inactive accounts. See how it goes through my steps. And, and then I get, oh, I have AA turned on, uh, closing reports. So I've got an analytical accounting and then the standard year end closing report. Um, this basically shows you what retained earnings it made. There it is. And I have multi-currency. <laughs> Come on. And you can see that it goes through all the various accounts that it set up and the balances it brought through forward. If you don't have multi-currency turned on, this is just one entry. Welcome to my test company. I have everything turned on. And then at the very bottom, it says what your retained earnings are. This is the only time that you can get the report in this format. If you reprint this after the fact, it's actually reversed and you will see the beginning balance accounts and the retained earnings and not the balance sheet accounts. It's a little odd, um, but that's kind of how it works. So these are printing all my P&L accounts, all right? Any questions on that? Because our next step is going through checking. All right. So check your close. Obviously, if you had an error pop up and it broke, you're done. <laughs> Call IT, get your backup restored. Try again in the test company another day. Is your retained earnings entry correct? Step number one. Um, if your retained earnings entry is not correct and everyone's been out of the system, restore that backup, recheck your posting types, go from there. Um, does your trial balance total to zero? Honestly, you should check this beforehand too. Um, it should obviously total to zero. Microsoft recommends running your financial reports before and after. It's a nice protection. Um, and then remember to go close your fiscal periods. Those fiscal period screens control who can post into what period. And it is a fabulous check against people posting things. Um, so that's tools, setup, company, fiscal periods. And that's these check boxes can't tell you how many times in January we have calls that people fat fingered a whole bunch of transactions, often in payables, to last year. And closing these boxes when you do the year end or as you go is the fastest protection against people posting to other years or other periods you don't want them posting to. All right. Do, 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 do. All right, any questions on the year-end closing before we move on to everyone's favorite, the 1099s?
All right. Moving on to 1099s then. All right. How do we print our 1099s? The 1099s are under routines. Print 1099s, obviously payables routines. Print 1099s. The printer icon here is an edit list. So it's going to show you what vendors are going to want to print 1099s and the balances for each of those. The one that says print forms is going to print your 1099s. We can also build you a smart list using smart list builder or smart list designer to show you what's going to be on your 1099s or who's your 1099 eligible vendors. That's up to you. It depends on how many you have. If you only have a handful, the edit list is perfectly fine. Um, from there, there are some 1099 changes. There has not been any significant changes recently. So again, on all our supported versions, you're pretty much all using um, the 2013 version and beyond. So you have the 1099, 1098 cover page form. You have the 1099 address IDs on your vendor cards. Um, and you have the more detailed transactions, which I'm going to show you on the next screen. What about our 1099s? These have to be encoded, so you cannot print on blank paper. You have to buy them from an office supply company. You cannot go online and get the sample from uh, the IRS and run a bunch of copies off. It says right on the sample, nope, you can't use this. You've got to buy them. Uh, check your alignment. So when you go to print it, there's a special pre-printed form option. So print one and see, I needed to scooch mine horizontally by a quarter of an inch to get it to hit the boxes. Um, there are no 1099 form changes for 2000, 2019, but there are more 1098 form changes. In 2016 and 2017, they have added more boxes horizontally and shoved them all over. The 2018 to 19 change is just this box has been added, this F version. If you want to print to the 1096 and you're using these boxes, you're going to need to get the year-end service pack update. That is what's going to contain the changes to the 1096. If you were printing the 1096 last year, you're probably fine unless you're going to use this new box. Um, Chances are it's not a payables type box. Most of the new boxes they add are, are strange things that most of us don't use. Um, any questions on the 1096 box and those changes? Beautiful. All right, so let's talk about you've checked it and something is wrong. First of all, during the year, fingers crossed, I hoped that people were not updating your vendor card if there was a vendor that you have used and you say, oh, it's supposed to be 1099 or the other way around. Oh, it's not supposed to be 1099. I do hope that all your users have been going to the utilities and updating the 1099 information on your vendors. Now, as um, I, this utility you need to be super careful with because for fun, we went to one of our test companies and loaded it up and hit process. And we changed every single vendor in the system and every single transaction that ever existed in history to a dividend. Don't do that, please. <laughs> Make sure that if you are using this utility, you are being super careful using your ranges for just the vendor that you're interested in and just the date ranges you are interested in. If it's an old vendor that you've used for several years and now you want to make them 1099, you're going to want to only hit the transactions for this year. In addition, there is a detailed screen. And so that's the edit 1099 transactions. And so if you've had a vendor that's been in process for a while, I would suggest on the previous screen, just changing the vendor information and then going to this screen to show to actually change the individual transactions. So it's under purchasing and transactions and it's edit 1099 transactions. And here you can see all the transactions and what tax type and boxes they've hit. Now remember that it is by payment date. So it goes to the 1099 based on when these invoices were paid. 
And so here you can change your tax types for each of the boxes for your transactions. The recommendation after 2013 is not to hit edit details. Um, we do have some new customers who choose to use the edit details to um, just put in those initial balances from the other accounting system. Um, but generally, we've had a whole conversation with you about it. Moving forward, your best bet is to edit this. If there are transactions listed here that say that they're going to a box and it was paid in 2018, it's going to print on a 1099. And so you're going to need to come here and change them or use the utility to change them all if someone was flagged as 1099 in the middle of the year. All right. Any questions on the 1099s? Because my next slides are recaps. Beautiful. All right. So going through my recap slides, Microsoft Knowledge Base links. These are the same links as last year, except for the payroll year-end info. That has a new link. So if you have the links from last year, they're the same links. The Microsoft steps um, are in quite detail. Um, you'll find some minor differences, but I talked about where I made differences, like the one where Payable says, oh, print your 1099s first. It's really not necessary. Um, if you're using fixed assets, payroll, or analytical accounting, do pull the Microsoft links and follow them precisely. Um, any final questions? Okay. Remember that we are available for break fix assistance Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 5, except for Christmas and New Year's. Um, we also, if you want to do your year-end close with us, feel free to schedule some time, contact support, and they'll help set up a time. We would rather you not call support and say, I need to close my years, will you help me? Because um, it is break fix support. So if you would like help closing your year, call ahead. Um, obviously, if your year-end crashes, call support. <laughs> but um, Hopefully, you've taken those backups, you've followed those steps, and it is all going to be perfect and beautiful for you guys. Any final questions? Beautiful. Well, thank you for coming. <laughs>